So, uh, Nir, you have an interesting story out there. So you started uh, working on secret projects in the Israeli army. How did you go from uh, working in the military to the, you know, R&D in the civil space? So in Israel, in Israel, everyone has to serve in the army. It's mandatory. Uh, I was in a special pro program in which in, instead of going to the army, you go to, to get your engineering degree and then you come back to the army for six years. And this is the first time I was actually um, exposed to the problem of classification of targets. Um, you need to know if um, that's um, an airplane or a missile flying in the air, technically translating into artificial intelligence problem. You have sort of developed a new paradigm, a new technology that combines the technology from radar with the machine learning. What are the reasons that led to do research in this sector? The radar, the radar as it is, is a um, like traditional type of radar, is as you said, signal processing. So I would say it's a um, type of three layer approach. Um, the first layer is detection, detecting the target, parameters of the targets, for example, velocity, range, azimuth and elevation. And then you have tracking, the target is moving through space and you have to track it through space and gather statistics on the target. That's called the tracking um, layer. And then on top of that, you have the classification layer. And that's where the beautiful AI innovation and radar signal processing is coupling together to produce a whole three layered solution to the target detection, tracking and classification problem. So basically what deep learning enabled us to do is, is basically create perception from something that before was just a bunch of uh, of uh, numbers, of signals. Uh, so now we can actually create perception and actually uh, have the machine understand. A human cannot look at the radar output and understand logically what's going on and basically have the machine brain basically make sense of it all and create an image that, that is actionable. For example, is, this a, is, is the object that is flying there is a bird or a drone or an airplane? So what problem can this technology solve in the medical space? What is the problem that today people cannot solve? So the problem, first of all, is to remotely sense remotely, and the, and the key here is remote, without touching the patient. Remotely sense vital signs, for example. So I'm breathing now, my heart is pounding. If I want to monitor it, I need to, the heart, I, want, I need to put a pulse oximeter on me, for example, or a, you know, a heart, heart rate monitor um, that is touching my body. So. This is, this is the kind of problems we've been working on since we started, even before we started Aleph, Aleph Zero. Um, and basically we have, right now we have a product that measure, measures, remotely measures respiration. I can put a device on your desk right now, or even farther away than your desk. Without touching you, put it somewhere on, on the wall of your room and it, uh, it will immediately track your breathing. Yeah. Another example is to, to battle the case, the phenomenon of SIDS, which is sudden infant death syndrome, uh, which basically, there's unexplainable uh, death in infants, in newborns, and that's uh, something that uh, we think can be uh, even uh, minimized further by using technologies like that, basically, to monitor your sleep and alert the parent if the baby stopped breathing, for example. But mm -hmm. five years from now, could we think that technologies like this could be, for example, mounted into a car to detect if something is happening to a person or if uh, let's say during a car accident, the person is still alive or what type of problem the person has. So th this, this is going to go into cars for sure because uh, there's actually, it, start, it started in Europe and it's coming to the US as well. Uh, there's actually a legislation that basically will force, I think it's by 2020 or 2021, all the car makers that want their security, their safety grading uh, to be as, as high as it is right now uh, to put to put uh, at least drivers uh, to monitor the driver for heart rate and respiration. So vital signs for the driver. I think they will also be in hospitals, they will be in uh, people's homes. Everybody will have these this kind of devices around their home in five to 10 years for sure. Now I wanna look at to, into a totally different field of application. And it's, I call it uh, the Super Bowl. I, I, I discovered talking to uh, Nier and Guy that basically there are people that use drones to go over the sport event and kind of videotape it and sell and resell or, or watch it for free. So what it is that this technology does in these particular cases? Let's say that the, the user 
is a is a flying drone over the arena, and he's he's going to photograph the game, and that's that's not allowed, obviously. And the the authorities, the the, the game authorities, don't don't want this to happen. Uh, so they can use our uh, you can you can use these kind of the, of uh, smart devices and basically detect where, whether this drone is a friendly drone, which which means maybe the sports arena has drones also flying and recording the event, which is okay. Maybe you can just cover where the, like the broader space of applications uh, that involve drones. You think about the radar. You think about uh, a airspace defense. Now, aerospace defense is something that has been done with the radar for tens of years now. A, a, a drone can be maliciously used or utilized for um, assassinating someone. So you want to protect VIPs. Um, you want to protect a, an airspace um, a, a, around prisons. So they won't be smuggling, they, they won't use drones to smuggle stuff in and out of the prison. It happens all the time. They, they use it to smuggle drugs, money, uh, cell phones. Other, other types of, of currencies that are used in, inside prisons. And yes, yes, so because the prison basically has walls, but the airspace is not protected. They never had to protect the airspace. But now anybody can buy a drone, hook up a cell phone onto it and, and land it inside a prison. First responders uh, situations or even counter-terror uh, situations. So can you tell us a couple of things? One, how is your technology helping to solve this problem? To what is the degree of uh, you know reliability that the technology has reached in this area? One is the ability to see to see through objects or through walls. Basically, uh, when you aim a radar at a wall, the radio free, the radio waves are going to go through the wall. And powered by AI algorithms, um, uh, machine learning algorithms, you can actually make sense of what you're seeing inside the the volume of the room. Think about a counter terrorist uh, situation in which a terrorist has hostages and is is uh, barricaded himself inside a room with hostages inside. And the hostages are sitting down and the terrorist is walking back and forth in the room. You can basically, right now, you need to, to, to what, what uh, they call, get eyes in the room and see what a terrorist is so you can, you can, uh, you can uh, design the attack so uh, the hostages are going to be saved and not hurt. So this is one application. The other one is, uh, is what, you, you, what you mentioned. For example, a person is trapped in a collapsed building after an earthquake. And a lot of uh, it happens a lot all over the world that people are trapped, um, and the, the you know the first responders and the rescue authorities they're trying to find them and save them. So using this kind of technology, you can actually find signs of life, like vital signs.